Hi, welcome to Bake to the Future, the show where we examine what is happening in the baking industry with a future-focused lens. Today, we had on, on ABA's outgoing president and CEO, Rob Mackey. You've heard him here on the show before. He is a favorite uh, guest of our listeners and for Katie and I to talk with him. And we always love hearing his expertise on what is going on in the baking industry. But today, we really wanted to sit down with him to get to know what his time at ABA was like. He's worked here for 27 years and he shared some stories with us from his time um, on the Hill, talking to Congress people and his, we got to know what his relationships with the ABA members has been like. And we also got him to look into the future as this show likes to do. And he kind of painted a picture of where he hopes ABA will be in five years. So listen in, it was a great conversation and, um, when this episode is released, we will know who the new president and CEO is. So you can check AmericanBakers.org to find out. And here it is. Welcome to Bake to the Future. And today we have a very special guest who is no stranger to the show. But as I was thinking this morning, as I was kind of gearing up for the day, this might be his last time on the show. We have outgoing sniff, sniff. President and CEO Rob Mackey with us. Rob, thanks for joining us. Thank you. Well, we'll see about that. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. We're we're it's never all say about, never. Yeah, exactly. It's right. all about next chapter. You know, all right. of all of that stuff. But right. you know, you were on our first episode, and we're delighted to have you here today to kind of have a different conversation. You know, I think we're going to touch on a lot of fun things. Um, uh, some of it will probably throw you for a loop. I know that we've talked about some things ahead of time. You've, you've tried to, to nail me in the past, so we'll see how that goes. And, and besides, <laughs> if you ever have any dead air to fill, I'm more than happy to fill that oh, dead air. Oh, we know that, Rob. <laughs> 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 but we wanted to have you on to really get some of your thoughts um, as you um, you know, part ways with ABA. We want to hear your thoughts. Um, your reflections on your time and how many years has it been that you've been at ABA? So it'll be, it's 27, believe it or not. 27 years. And then how many of those were as president and CEO? I'm I'm wrapping up my 17th year. um, And I can tell you, I remember 10, you know, like, wow, that's a pretty big milestone. Everything, every day after that's a blur. Yep. Time. So you're saying it went by fast. It went by fast. We want to hear maybe some highlights. What were some, you know, it was a blur, but I'm sure there were some maybe member encounters. Um, we've gotten some tastes of those stories in the past, but we think it'll be really fun for our listeners and the AB members to hear um, some of those memories. Good. Now this and, is and gonna... remember, this is a, you know, PG rated, I would say. Oh, don't worry about that. Okay. All right. <laughs> but my only concern is this is going to be a 20 episode podcast, right? <laughs> or 20 minute. Yeah. 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 No, no, no. 20 episode. You oh. said. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. No. Um, Boy, there's so many great stories, um, but I, I, I want to start um, a little bit at the beginning, um, and, and I've shared this uh, before, but, you know, when I interviewed to come to ABA, um, a good friend of mine who's still one of my best friends, uh, Kevin Burke, uh, was the vice president of government relations, and um, so when he was leaving to go work for the grocery industry, he said, hey, you ought to, you ought to interview, and I, was, I had a great job. I was working for the Associated General Contractors, great boss, all that stuff, and, and you know, he wore me down um, and convinced me, um, and so went through the interview process, um, immediately hit it off with my predecessor, Paul Avenante. Um, and the conversation was all about, you know, can I do this? Can I do that? I really was looking for a home. You know, and an industry that I had enormous respect for, particularly, you know, such a storied industry with a lot of history and, and, you know, the immigrant uh, relationships and, you know, all of these different things. And so, you know, went through the process and and got hired uh, by Paul. And then a few years later, I asked Paul because I found out that another very good friend of mine was the runner up candidate. um, And and I said, so, Paul, I'm just curious. And he and, he and I had, like, very similar backgrounds and all of this stuff. And I said, Paul, so what was the deciding factor? How did you sort of decide? And he said, well, to be very honest with you, we went to lunch. You ate from the bread basket, and the other guy didn't. And I went, come on. He said, no, that's there's some truth to that. Now, 
Paul likes to tell a good story, so um, you know I'm going to take that at face value. So, uh, advice to anybody looking for a job in the industry: <laughs> eat from the bread basket. You eat what you believe. Yes. <laughs> so, what was that like when you first? You know, it was the '90s. Yes. At the time, yes, so Haley, what, it was the '90s. I'm just doing the math. What were the membership? What who? Well, who were you talking to? What were you dealing with? Yeah. Maybe just like paint us a picture. And I'm just trying to imagine too. I'm remembering like the early 90s and you know late 80s. There weren't like computers to do this work. You were right. probably on the phone all the time. So like oh. even from the, like the logistics standpoint, mm-hmm. it was a lot different. Uh, you don't even want to know. Um, no, we, we do. <laughs> wow, I didn't realize this was going to be a technology discussion. I would love to hear about <laughs> it. I, I remember one of my vivid memories is we used to do IBIE manually. So it's now what a fourteen million dollar show with a thousand exhibitors and twenty thousand you know attendees, and so all of the exhibit space sales would come in on on fax paper. You know, all the registrations would come in on the fax machine or, or by mail. But I can remember many times at IBIE, I'd come into the office early on a Monday, and there would be. It would like somebody shot it out of a cannon. There was paper all over the floor that came out of the fax machine because people were trying to get in on that deadline, which was like midnight on Sunday or something like that. And so you'd walk in and in, in Nikki Gayhart's office, there was paper scattered everywhere. And I'm like, oh, it must be IBIE again. So oh, gosh. we've, we've come a long, mean. long way <laughs> mm-hmm. since those bad old days. Even, um, you know, you were specifically doing government relations at the time. So even what did that look like going on? the hill all in person you know where you do a lot of meetings the logistics and maybe some of the issues yeah Yeah, yeah. there's probably some carryover maybe not with the technology but with no no and and, you know just like the baking industry you know the government relations piece is very much a relationship business even today and what we tried to do at aba was we tried to leverage the members back home you know so we tried to, to do those connections but again it was a very manual like i didn't even have a cell phone you know, when I started at ABA, so this tells you how far it goes back. Um, and so it was always about being visible, about boots on the ground. And so we would bring in, like I can remember, we would bring in our chair um, once or twice a year, and we would go and see members of Congress from every place that they had a plant. Um, and it was really about building those relationships. And then when they went home, we would say, okay, we're going to set up this meeting for you and your facility. We'll do a tour. Um and and it was very hands on, very manual. I mean, literally walking through, um, you know, walking through the the halls of Congress and and introducing members and, and working those relationships. But I tell you what, one of the early early on in my my tenure um, is, and this happened both, you know, when I was vice president of government relations, and then shortly after became president is I can remember walking through to get. We were going to a meeting on the Senate side. We were cutting through the tunnel from the House side to the. To the Senate side, and we had the ABA chair at that time. Um, I believe it was George Deese. I could be wrong. Um, but anyway, we're cutting through the shortcut through the basement of the Capitol, and here comes Speaker Boehner, who I, I knew. I knew um, Speaker Boehner when he was in the Ohio legislature. Long story I won't go into. And he's coming the other way, and he looks up, and he sees me, and, and um, it's myself and Paul and our chair, and we're cutting through the Capitol, and he says, hey, it's the Bakers. It's great to see the Bakers. And, you know, we just, you know, we said hello for a little bit and then kept going our separate ways. And um, our chair at the time leaned over to me and said, now, that was a really neat experience because he knows that you're the Bakers, so that our interests are represented up here. It's not Rob Mackey. It's not Paul Abenante. It's the Bakers. And I said, that's that's what we're all about. You know, we should be about the industry. We should be about you, the company back home. You're the ones that are employing people. Um, you're the ones that are making products. And so it shouldn't be about us, you know, individually. And I, and I remember you telling me a fun story about Speaker Boehner again. I don't know if he was speaker at the time. And it had something to do with the ergonomics bill. Yes. And the way that that went down was very interesting. And perhaps you could regale us with that story because I remember it being a fun one. Yeah, so it's interesting. Um, just a little bit of context is um, the ergonomics issue impacted the baking industry way before as a result of a, a massive OSHA citation on, on one of our members. Um, and so we came, to th- we came to that whole conversation very early. Um, and as a result, we ended up leading 
um, co-chairing the National Coalition on Ergonomics with the American Trucking Associations. Uh, very large, you know, they've got like 400 people, and, and we were ABA, we had like 12 um, at the time, uh, but because we had all that knowledge. But anyway, to the point, it was like a six-year battle to get this thing revoked, and so um, I can remember, again, that, that exame spot, walking through the tunnel through the Capitol to go to the Senate side to meet with Majority Leader Frist, and this is in t- 2001, and, you know, who should come the other way but Speaker Boehner, and he says, hey, where y'all going? And I said, we're going to go meet with Senator Frist. Um, they're going to vote later today on um, a Congressional Review Act resolution to defund the ergonomics regulation, which is like the nuclear weapon against um, uh, regulations. And it had never been used before. It had been stuck in a bill that had been passed, you know, 10 years prior. And so he just looks at it. He says, well, good luck with that. But if you get it done, come see me first thing in the morning and we'll get it scheduled on the House floor. So done and done. We got it. We got that through. We went over with Frist. We had the votes to spare. Um, and, And again, I think it really reinforced the power of partnerships and, and coalitions. We had a 300 plus coalition member coalition, um, and it was ABA, very small but very mighty organization, American Trucking Associations, and then 298 of our closest folks. And it was, we worked with like the counties and the school boards who all would have been covered by this, the Postal Service, all of this stuff, all these non traditional allies that we were able to, over time, pull together, and we got it over the finish line. And so that next morning, 8 o'clock in the morning, we're standing outside the Speaker's office, and he comes in, and he's like, yeah, I saw you got that vote through, so I guess you're going to want it on the floor. And I said, how does Thursday look? <laughs> <laughs> and sure enough, we got it done. The President President Bush signed it. Um, and and it's one of the things I've got. I've got very few things hanging on my wall. It's one of the things is the red line. Uh, which is the actual signed piece of legislation um, when it goes through the process is hanging on my wall because it was a monumental undertaking, but I also think it put ABA on the map. When was that? When was the timeline? It was 2001? It was, it was early 2001. I want to say okay. like March. I'd have to go look back on my yeah, wall. Yeah, I look but, at your wall. Yeah. <laughs> no, because it was, it was an interesting play where the, the, the Clinton administration had passed, you know, the, the uh, ergonomics. They'd gotten it through OSHA, but not to get into all the weeds on the Congressional Review Act, but certain regulations that pass within a narrow window before the change in administration are subject to review by Congress. And Congress basically is thumbs up, thumbs down. But if Congress passes it thumbs down and it's a a resolution of disapproval or something like that, uh, what it means is that not only is that regulation done, you cannot bring it back in a similar form um, and, and so we've never had an ergonomics regulation. I think the industry was already well ahead in terms of addressing ergonomic issues. Um, but this was this was a massive overreach um, on the part of, of OSHA. It would have created a massive federal workers' comp system, and that's always been the uh, jurisdiction of the states. Um, and it would have basically, if you were moving like a stack of trays, it would have you would have had to have all of this equipment to do that, and, and redundancy and. You know, it just it just would not have been workable at all in the banking industry. And so you're talking about, you know, the relationships and, you know, running into people in the the hallways of Congress. And, and you know, I know things have changed over the last, you know, 20, 20, 25 years. Um, and certainly from the last few years, yeah. it's changed even more like there how you know, I just know that it's from like, you know, you do Teams and Zoom and things like that. And so how else have things changed in the GR front? No, I think there's just been massive changes. And I think the the technology that we all, you know, we all use, it's in our pocket now. Um, it's on our wrists now. All of that technology is now in play. Um, we started... Uh, shortly after I became president, we we added some grassroots capability where you know people could go. We could update you know what the key issues were. We could have sample letters, um, and then our members could go and just simply plug in their their specific information. It could fire off an email, or if they wanted, they could print it out and send it uh, via snail mail to Capitol Hill. Um, but but also there's you know the whole advent of social media and Twitter. Um, you know there's times when if we've got a big issue. Uh, and we're getting ready to do a meeting um, with a member of Congress or we're going to do something in the state. 
Um, we can fire off, you know, on LinkedIn and Twitter, you know, just, you know, and we do this all the time, is economic data. You know, we're in the 5th District of Ohio. How many jobs are in that district? Um, and, and we've got, you know, we've got our economic footprint for each congressional district, and we're able to attach that. And, and it's sort of an attention getter. Um, and then I think, you know, Katie, you and Haley have done a phenomenal job of taking that to the next level with our, our infographics that we've used. And, and certainly we have, you know, all of those tools have been enormously helpful. And then this podcast. I mean, we, you know, I don't know if we can track how many folks on Capitol Hill, you know, are, are watching and listening to it, but it's, it's another communication tool. And I think it, what I love about it is it's so much more conversational. Mm-hmm. Um, and so we're meeting our members, but we're also meeting a broader audience where they like their content. Yeah, and I guess, you know, too, what, what it, I guess I'm trying to get at is do you see the relationships having changed over the last 20, 30 years or the nature of how – you know, business on the hill gets done. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, you know, when I when I started, when I came to Washington in the '80s, mm-hmm. it was it was much more collegial. And and you know, the old and, and I, I sort of cut my teeth. You know, everybody talks about Ronald Reagan and Tip O'Neill, and and a lot of that is true, but a lot of it is legend too. Because you know, every day Tip O'Neill woke up figuring, how can I beat? Ronald Reagan at his own game. And, you know, politics is in Washington has always been, you know, a, a full contact sport. And But what's happened is the tone and tenor and the polarization in Washington um, has changed dramatically. And so, for instance, when when I first came, they would take the freshman class, Republicans and Democrats, you know, probably sprinkled in a couple of independents, and they go off site. They go down to Williamsburg or Annapolis, you know, and they would do these sort of joint leadership training, how the process works, all of that kind of stuff. And those days are long gone. Now each, you know, each party does their own thing. Um, and, you know, it's it's less and less about the, the substance of the policy and more about how to win at the game. Um, and so you have to adapt to that. And you've got to, you know, you've got to know exactly where the ground is and, and where certain people are and the personalities and who's talking to who and who's not talking to so-and-so. And, um, and you just have to navigate through that. The good news is the issues that we work on are are below that that stratospheric, the the big picture issues that gets everybody all all worked up and and up in arms and stuff. Um, and so, you know, we're still able to get a lot of stuff done. But it, at the end of the day, it comes down to relationships and and knowing how to navigate you know that process. But you know, and it, this is an interesting and totally coincidental is, you know, we've had some key go-to champions you know for folks like Roy Blunt who I met when he was a freshman congressman from Missouri and he was one of our champions on the ergonomics in the house way back in the day you know and then you know he ended up in the house leadership and then senator from Missouri and always been a great champion for the food industry uh, Rob Portman from Ohio good good friend his long time we've done events for him at the Bundy Bacon Museum in Urbana Ohio He's had a really strong relationship. You know, we could call him and, you know, he would take the phone call um, and, you know, we would get some things done. Um, you know, and I can go on and on. And, oh, Richard Burr from North Carolina. What, what's sad is, you know, these are these are folks that get things done. I, they're, you know, they're principled. They've got their value system. They're conservative Republicans, all of them. But they also know that they're here to get things done, to get the people's business done. And they've always approached it that way. And so the three of them are leaving Congress this year. And so, you know, one of the things that I shared with the board a few weeks ago was, We've got to reestablish new new champions and, and in this new environment. And so we're going to have to really rely on our members who may have existing relationships. Um, and then we're just going to have to hit the ground running hard in January and get to know, you know, a new crop. But that's just the nature of the business that we're in. You know, every two years, people change. And every four years, the administration could change. You know, that's a potential. Um, and so it's just a constant re-nurturing relationships, developing new relationships, Um and I think all the modern tools help us do that. And I think that kind of future um, focus that you're just talking about leads me to my next question, which is, where is your vision for where ABA can go in the next, say, five years? I think I think there's a great opportunities. I think um, there's a really strong foundation. Uh, I've never seen the industry and the members more engaged in ABA activities across the spectrum. Um, and I think... 
you know, a lot of it has. I, I think we have never proven our value to the industry and, frankly, to the country, um, but during the pandemic. You know, we and we have talked about this many times and, and I don't want to plow old ground, but, you know, I think we really stood up and we met the mission head on um, and this industry deserves enormous credit. Um, but there was a lot. We, we just developed a much closer relationship with our members than we'd ever had before. Um, and that has continued through the, the, the supply chain challenges, um, a number of big policy issues, um, you know, that are on the horizon. So I see, number one, that closer engagement is going to be really important. Um, and we talked about building new relationships. We're going to lean on the members, you know, to help propel that for us going forward. Um, I also think, you know, a lot of folks don't like to talk about political resources. Uh, I think the way that the executive committee and the board and the members have stepped up to make, you know, ABA, uh, American Bakers Pack, you know, one of the top two or three food industry packs um, gives us a whole level of credibility and visibility in this, you know, contact sport of politics. And so we, we leaned heavily on the relationships that the PAC helped to develop during the pandemic so that we were able to call, you know, Mike DeWine, governor of Ohio, we we're able to call Richard Burr, others, and just say, listen, we've got this problem we need to fix. And, you know, they, they jumped on it. And, um, you know, so I think that in combination. And then we have pound for pound, we have one of the best teams here in D.C. Um, in terms of the, the GR team. Um, there's the level of expertise and judgment and knowledge of that group. I stack up to organizations two, three, four times our size. Um, and because we're closely connected to the members about results, it's not Washington. A lot of times is about noise and talk and chatter and, and all this stuff. And ABA has always been about results and, and bottom line results. And we don't win all the time, but I think that gives us great credibility. And again, that engagement of the members so that like if we're at a coalition meeting or with the White House or USDA or FDA, whatever it is, Capitol Hill, people know that we're speaking from our members, that our members have shared their information and data from a real world perspective. Um, and I think one of the things we've worked really hard is not to talk in – we, we, we fall into the trap. I'm just as guilty, you know, in terms of Washington speak, you know, in, tar- in terms of regulatory speak or congressional speak. You know, we try to bring the real world impact of the, some of these issues, um, you know, that are going on to members of Congress, because that's what that's what resonates with them. You know, that those stories, those vignettes that our members have become very comfortable sharing with us is, is really important. So I think there's a really strong platform. Um, I know that we're gearing up in March to do another round of priority setting with the board. Um, and I'm surprised that more organizations in town don't do this. You know, we literally bring all of our, you know, for the first three months of the year, we bring our professional groups together. They prioritize from a risk assessment. They look at the issues and they say, okay, that's going to have a big impact on our bottom line, or that's a big opportunity in the marketplace. And so we bring all of that together and we bring it in front of the board at a very, very high executive level. And we go through and we say, okay, these are the six, eight, ten issues that are going to be the top priority that we're going to lead on. That if we don't take the lead, isn't, aren't going to happen. These are the other basket of issues that we're going to play a supporting role with some of our allies and coalition partners uh, around town. And I think that focus, that priority gives us huge leg up around town. Because we're not spread too thin. We're not chasing every little, you know, thing that's ha- that's popping up, um, you know. So I think we can be more proactive and less reactive. And you're speaking of results, and I do know that our members and we strive for results and not just in the GR realm, you know. So, you know, certainly 20, 30 years ago, we didn't have the education team. We didn't have uh, this wealth of research that we're building. Right. So I would say that we have grown. But what are some results that are still undone, that are still not quite where you thought it would be yeah. as you departed? Yeah, no, that's a great question, Katie. There's, you know, as a board member reminded me just last week, you know, there's always unfinished, unfinished business. And so, uh, and I think it's, it's the nature of the industry, but it's also the nature of the work that we do here. Um, so I would say number one is workforce. I, I think we've done a lot of great work in the workforce area. Um, it remains the number one, two, and three issue. We just heard about it again at the board meeting a few weeks ago. Um, and I think we've done a really good job. Um, we brought more resources. You mentioned, you know, some of the, the Baking Manufacturing Academy. 
uh, the Baking Works website, the research that we've done and propelled to give arm our members with, you know, data and information so that when they're out recruiting and, and frankly retaining. Um, but I also think we need to have a clear-eyed conversation, and, and it's happening, um, but we also need to have a clear-eyed conversation about how is this industry going to produce the great products that it makes going forward? And are there changes that can be made um, in that way? I also think that, um, you know, we, we started down this road. I, I got to know Jonathan Warburton from the UK, one of the largest family companies in the UK. And they have this great series of videos that are targeted to their, their associates. You watch them, and it's like watching an inspiring Disney movie about what it means to be a route sales representative for Warburton's and the pride that goes into that and what it's like to be a production manager or, or just somebody that, that does sanitation on the plant floor. It lifts these people up. And so that would be something I would challenge the industry to do is, is how do we lift up the, the incredible work, the purpose-filled work that this industry does every day um, so I think that's some unfinished business that, that the industry hopefully will tackle, and, and they'll figure it out. I'm, I'm, I'm fully confident. Um, you know, there's, there's, there's always unfinished business. So, Well, is there anything else that you wanted to share before we wrap up today? You know, I would say that, um, you know, I, I, there's a couple of other, uh, of other things is, and, and one ask. Um, I would ask anybody listening, let's start here. I would ask anybody listening to extend – the grace and the courtesy and the friendship that was extended to me, not only when I joined ABA, but also when I became president to whoever my successor is. Um, They're going to need your support. The team is going to need their support. Um, And so I I feel so blessed, um, you know, at a professional level, but at a personal level for the great relationships that I've developed. And and the caring and um, just the support, even even during some very challenging times, you know, early on in my tenure as president, that we, we rallied together and we got through. Um, and those bonds. Um, now, I hope that we're leaving a stronger platform for, for my successor, and I think we are. Um, but I also say it's really important that whoever my successor is has the support of the industry um, and, and is welcomed with open arms into the industry. Um, and I think they will because um, that's just the way this industry is. So that, that would be my one thing. Um, and I would say, and it would be very, very remiss. Um, there's so many joys that I could talk about, but I will tell you the greatest joy is the people. The, the people in the industry that I've gotten to know, you know, the folks that are in the Baking Hall of Fame, you know, or folks that are too shy to be in the Baking Hall of Fame just because they're head down kind of folks. And, you know, as a leader, as a growing leader, you know, to have an opportunity to network and, and, and just, you know, learn from them and, and be a sponge around them. You know, George D. Gary Prince, um, Ron Torano, Joe Schwabel, John Paterakis. Danielle Ceviche, who has just been an incredible mentor for me over the years uh, and an inspiration, but also, also is this incredible staff, the incredible professional team that I've had the great honor of working with um, and getting to know and and struggling with as we, you know, it does feel like it's a cliche, we're a family and and family struggle at times. And, um, you know, we've had our struggles, but we've always been very, very supportive of each other and, you know, again, I just I have been so blessed uh, to work with this amazing group of professionals. And every day I'm always amazed by what we get done. I've got two questions to wrap up. One is one sentence of advice that you would give your successor. I would say the one piece of advice I would give is to ask really good questions. Don't be afraid. And then listen to the answers. Okay. And one word to describe your time at ABA. Spectacular. That's a great note to end on. Thank you so much, Rob, for talking with us and sharing your thoughts. We really appreciate it. It has been my pleasure. Thank you, Haley. Thank you, Katie. So 19 more of these? (laughs) Yeah. Next up, we'll have more (laughs) stories from Rob. More stories from Rob. From 2001 to 2007. (laughs) That'll be be the happy hour version. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Share your feedback on this episode and more by emailing hello at AmericanBakers.org or leave us a voicemail at BakeToTheFuture.org. We love hearing from you. 
And don't forget to subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts, Apple, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, Amazon Music, or Ghana.